Right. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me along. So I'm going to present some data from both a published and unpublished study, um, where we try to compare the level of exposure and long-term e-cigarette users with both smokers and never smokers. <coughs> I should uh, make a declaration of interest. I've never received any funding from the tobacco e-cigarette industry, however, I am a vapor. So, um, well, we're all aware that e-cigarettes have become rather popular, um, not only in the UK, but also in Poland, I suspect, um, and there are some questions over the cytotoxicity and impact on health function of e-cigarettes. So they're somewhat controversial, insofar as earlier studies suggested that there may be some carcinogens and toxins delivered in both the aerosol and e-liquids, and that there may also be negative health effects, for instance, on cardiovascular and respiratory function, but most of these studies, or virtually all of these studies, have been conducted in mice or other rodents, which has led the media, for instance, in the UK to speculate that using e-cigarettes is just as bad as smoking cigarettes. However, there's very little knowledge about the long-term effects of e-cigarette use and also the bodily level exposure in e-cigarette users. And this is important because we know that uh, user characteristics interact with the device, and so these kind of machine yields aerosols themselves alone are not that informative. And often studies tend to use problematic control groups. So often you see studies that report results comparing e-cigarettes with never smokers. And we know, of course, that most e-cigarettes are mainly used by smokers or ex-smokers. Um, there were three studies on actual uptake, and these have found quite consistently that toxicants are reduced among e-cigarette users compared with smoking, but they tend to look at short-term results. So the first study I'm going to present was recently published in Arnold's Internal Medicine. And we were interested in long-term use of e-cigarettes. In particular, we wanted to assess exposure to nicotine uh, and known smoking-related carcinogens and toxicants in long-term e-cigarettes users relative to NRT users and cigarette smokers. So you may wonder why NRT. The reason for this is that we think that uh, long-term NRT use is probably rather similar to long-term e-cigarette use insofar as it's used for harm reduction. This is part of the harm reduction paradigm. And as this is a quasi-case control study, we wanted to have participants who are very similar to e-cigarette users. So that's why we looked at NRT users. The second reason is that NRT has been around for a rather long time, for decades, and so it has a known safety <laughs> profile. And the idea behind this is if we'd find no differences between e-cigarette users and NRT users, we would speculate that their risk profile is rather similar, i.e. low risk. As I mentioned, this is part of the e-cigarettes have become part of the harm reduction paradigm. Just to quickly give you a definition of what I consider to be harm reduction, which is the attempt to lessen the harm from smoking, psychological or physical, without complete cessation of one or more tobacco constituents. And why do we suggest this? Because we know that some smokers cannot or will not stop smoking. And in fact, if you look at the production of cigarette sticks worldwide, despite the best efforts of tobacco control uh, field, research field, it is still predicted to rise substantially over the next few decades. So the idea behind harm reduction really is that we want to switch people from the highest risk product, that is combustible cigarettes, to low risk product. Either completely, switch it all completely, or partially, so that some of these cigarettes are replaced with a lower risk product. So that's what we call dual use. And it is interesting to note, of course, in this context that e-cigarettes are primarily used by smokers currently, or ever tobacco users, um, but some of these are never smokers, so it's also important to look at those. And most e-cigarette users, of course, are currently also tobacco users, so they're dual users. And I just want to present you with some data from the Smoking Toolkit study uh, to make this point. So these are data for the last <laughs> three years inclusive. As a, uh, as a uh, percent of the total population, about 5% in the UK are currently using e-cigarettes. Now, somewhat surprisingly, possibly for you, you can see that actually it hasn't increased over the last three years, it's still 5%. What has changed, however, is some of the composition of people who are using it. So in grey you see never tobacco users, and you can see very low prevalence of uh, e-cigarette use by never tobacco <coughs> users, but there is some of it. What we can see, however, is an increase in the use of e-cigarettes by former tobacco users. And uh, yesterday the results came out for the UK smoking prevalence rates, which is about 15.8 percent, is a historic low, first time below 16 percent. And one might argue that this is in part due to the fact that e-cigarettes have become uh, more popular. But as I mentioned before, of course, most e-cigarettes are used by current tobacco users, vast uh, majority. So the first study I'm going to present, we were interested particularly looking at former tobacco users, but the second study, which isn't published yet, we were interested to look at uh, what happens when people who are uh, dual users use e-cigarettes, and also how e-cigarettes compare with not using anything at all. So the aim of the second study is to assess, uh, to assess exposure nicotine and carcinogen toxicants 
in long term e-cigarette users relative to never smokers, but also to have a look at the effects of dual use. Um, the design is a very pragmatic cross-sectional study. People came in for a single laboratory appointment and we purposely recruited participants in the London area for this first study. Uh, and these are smokers, so these are daily smokers who so have been smoking for at least uh, six months. Or they were single users of either NRT or e-cigarettes for at least six months, having stopped at least six months ago. And in this study, we also had dual users, but I'm going to talk about this in greater detail with regards to study two, so I'm not going to present you results on that for the first study. And in terms of the measures of the analysis, um, we looked at social demographic characteristics, smoking characteristics, and product use characteristics, and we measured breath and urine samples. And we are particularly interested to look at uh, total nicotine equivalents to see how effective these products are in delivering nicotine. But then we also are interested in some risk biomarkers, some biomarkers of exposure. The first one we looked at is NNAL, it's a metabolite of NNK, which is a potent lung carcinogen, and is mandated by the WHO to be lowered in tobacco smoke, tobacco products. We also looked at acrolein, which is a major contributor to respiratory effects, acryl nitrile, which is very specific to tobacco use, and it's also a major contributor to cancer risk, butadine, which is a major contributor to cancer risk again, and carbon monoxide, which contributes to cardiovascular disease. And all of these are mandated to be lowered by the WHO. So we selected these urine samples. They were frozen, shipped to the CDC for analysis, and then we used generalized linear models uh, using a log link in the gamma distribution to compare uh, the exposure among these different groups. And importantly, we adjusted for social demographic characteristics, but also smoking characteristics and health characteristics, and latency product use, and then also obviously for the urine uh, samples, we corrected for creatinine. So results of study one. Perhaps unsurprising for anybody in this room, um, you can see that both of these products, NRT and e-cigarettes, are very effective in delivering nicotine. Now, this is always expressed, this next couple of slides will look the same. Basically, on the left-hand side, you have NRT users, and the right-hand side, you have e-cigarette users. And this is expressed as a proportion of the exposure levels in cigarette smokers. So here, we see the 100% line, and you see NRT users, long-term users, get as much nicotine out of their NRT as, e as cigarette smokers. And the same is true for e-cigarette users. So no differences at all here. Then looking at some of the um, risk biomarkers, NNAL, as I said, is a potent lung carcinogen. Here's a level for cigarette smokers, 100%. And what we see is a significant reduction in exposure in both NRT and e-cigarette users compared with conventional cigarette smokers. And given uh, the publication of PHE report on harm reduction in e-cigarettes, and people complained about putting too precise a number on these reduction, uh, levels of reduction, I just wanted to show you that actually this is a 97.5% reduction exposure to NNAL. Going on to look at acrolein, which uh, is implicated in, in pulmonary edema, for instance. You can, again, you see cigarette-only levels, 100%, and we see a reduction among NRT users and e-cigarette users. And the level of reduction here is about 66.6%. For acrylic nitrile, which has been in animals at least impl uh, implied in, or implicated in glial cell tumors, so brain tumors, there's the smoker level, 100%, and we see, again, a significant reduction. So similar story. And the reduction levels here are 97.1% compared with cigarette smokers. Butadine, which is involved in leukemia, again, we see significant reductions in both NRT and e-cigarette-only users. Reduction level is 89%. And lastly, carbon monoxide, which can cause cardiovascular disease. And here's the 100% level again. And the reduction levels are here around 60, uh, 70%. So, as you can see, there's a consistent level of reduction observed in both NRT and e-cigarette users. The second study was conducted in three different sites, so in Poland, UK, and in the US, and a much larger sample. Here we were particularly interested at e-cigarettes, not NRT, and then also included never smokers. So the same kind of groups again. First, we have smokers, have been smokers for at least six months. Then we had single users of e-cigarettes for at least six months, not using any other product. Then dual users of both cigarettes and e-cigarettes for at least six months, and then we also had non-smokers. Same biomarkers were assessed, and we also measured uh, social demographic outcomes and questionnaires, etc. It's the same as the published study, but we controlled for fewer confounders, I should point out. Now, for the nicotine metabolites, as I think everybody could expect in this audience, nobody who is a non smoker had high, very high levels. In fact, they're barely, they can be barely seen on this graph. 
compared with all users of either e-cigarettes or cigarettes or dual users. And these, of course, are highly significant differences here. So um, it's always the same for the next couple of slides. First up, non-smokers, then you have e-cigarette single users going on to dual users and then cigarette smokers in the far right. Far right. But what we also observed, interestingly enough, is that this particular sample, e-cigarette users, in fact, had higher levels of nicotine uh, in their urine compared with cigarette smokers. So nicotine delivery by e-cigarettes is at least as effective as by standard conventional cigarettes. Looking at NNAL, so the, uh, one of the nitrosamines, what we see is some kind of dose-response relationship here. So e-cigarette users have slightly higher levels than non-smokers. Dual users have higher levels than single users, and cigarette smokers have by far the highest level of exposure to NNAL. For acrolein, the differentiation is clearer between those people who use combustible cigarettes and not, so non-smokers and e-cigarette users have lower levels than dual users and cigarette smokers. These are all significant differences here. And the same, actually it's not, the same is not true for acrolein nitrile. Again, here's a bit more of a dose-response relationship, so non-smokers have barely any uh, levels of exposure to acrolein nitrile. E-cigarette users have slightly increased levels. And then both dual users and cigarette smokers have much higher levels than the other two groups, significant differences here. It's rather surprising to us that e-cigarette users would have higher levels of acrylic nitrile, and we suspect this may be to do with the fact that some of these e-cigarette users may have had the odd cigarette. But what you can also see is here that dual users clearly have some kind of reduction, observe some kind of reduction of acrylic nitrile. Um, so the 95% confidence interval don't overlap here, suggesting that dual use has some kind of impact on consumption of cigarettes. Butadine, the pattern is the same as before. If you use combustible cigarettes, whether you use e-cigarettes as well or not, it doesn't matter really. Um, you have higher levels than somebody who is using e-cigarettes alone or nothing at all. So, coming to the conclusion of this presentation, in terms of complete substitution, I think it's quite obvious and you will not be surprised by this finding that e-cigarettes are as effective as cigarettes in delivering nicotine. And it's associated with substantially reduced intake of toxicants compared with smokers. Um, and interestingly enough, I think, and this is the unpublished results, it is associated with a similar intake of most toxicants and carcinogens compared with both non-smokers and NRT users. Partial substitution does not appear to increase your consumption of nicotine or nicotine intake, and is associated with a limited, albeit limited, but reduced intake of toxicants compared with smokers, and unsurprisingly, of course, if you are dual users, you will have uh, higher levels of carcinogen toxicants than somebody who's a non-smoker. Um, but just on the term dual use, I think it's important to point out, these are data I think that were published earlier this year uh, from an American study, that dual use is complex. So um, I think these are youth data, and here you can see on the far right hand side, these are kids who self identify as dual users, so they smoke cigarettes. And about 13% of those also use e cigarettes every single day. So they're considered to be dual users. At the same token, the vast majority of those kids, about a third of them, use e-cigarettes only once or twice per month. But they're also dual users. So obviously the risk reduction associated with dual use is very much dependent on your use characteristics. In terms of the results of this, I would suggest, therefore, in terms of complete substitution, that uh, e-cigarettes are clearly a viable alternative to, for traditional harm production products, including NRT, and that substantial health benefits of e-cigarettes use is only likely for incomplete cessation by still cigarettes, but there you can expect some kind of reduction risk. And just to move on to the next talk, I thought, you know, give you some data on heat not burn products. So these are our data, and I compare them against uh, uh, data from PMI, published earlier this year in NTR, uh, Ludica et al. Um, I want to point out that there, we can't have any kind of direct comparison here, as A, we're talking about different populations. The study of the heat not burn product, ICOS, was conducted in Japan. People had been using these uh, devices for only three months. In our study, people had been using the device for at least six months. Different analytical methods were used, and also we can't adjust for any confounders. However, this is what we find if we compare these results that are published, and can see that, of course, perhaps unsurprisingly, again, heat burn products are just as effective as e-cigarettes and cigarettes in delivering nicotine to users. In terms of nitrosamines, these are published results. What we see is some these are, I'm not saying anything about statistical significance here, but it's very obvious that heat not burn products have reduced, lead to reduced exposure to nitrosamines compared with cigarettes and possibly higher levels compared with e-cigarettes. And a similar pattern is observed when you look at acrolein, one of the uh, biomarkers here, 3-HPMA. 
So these kind of preliminary results would suggest that heat not burn products seem to fall somewhere between e-cigarettes and conventional cigarettes on the harm spectrum. And one sort of surprising result for me, and I can see some of the uh, uh, participants in the study, or the participants, uh, people who conduct this research in the audience, so I wonder if they can explain it to me, is the results in regards to carbon monoxide. So in the study by Ludic et al, um, results uh, are present in terms of carboxyhemoglobin percent in blood, which for the purposes of this presentation, I have uh, converted to carbon monoxide parts per million, which is how we analyzed it. And this is the results that's reported in the published study, which is much higher than what you would expect if people are not exposed to any combustion. So this, the cutoff is usually in clinical trials is eight parts per million, whereas in the published study, the results are reported as 2.9% carboxyhemoglobin, which is nearly twice the standard cutoff for non-smokers. So I'm intrigued by that result, and I'm wondering if some of the audience can explain to me why these high levels of carbon monoxide or carbon, carbon monoxide observed. Anyhow, last I just want to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, and of course, Cancer Research UK, who funded this study. Thank you.